welcome to the Merrin Patar module. Merrin Patar was the 13th son of Ramses II. Um, he must have given up waiting, he really must have done. Um, Ramses II lived an awfully long time and he did outlive 12 of his sons. Um, so Merrin Patar was quite elderly when he came to the throne. Uh, we reckon around his 60s. Uh, so he didn't have a lot of time. So this temple is not a big temple, but it does follow the sta standard layout. He um, uh, also built the tomb, KV8, which um, is one of those tombs in the Valley of the Kings, sometimes open, sometimes not open. But if you do get a chance to go into it, it's very interesting because there aren't many 19th dynasty tombs open, and it does have a very nice sarcophagus. Now, the guy's in a hurry, and right next door is the um, temple of Amenhotep III. And uh, it had been built in a poor location, which is actually quite surprising, um, and had tumbled down. So uh, there were all these blocks there, a line. And, and it wasn't bad to use these blocks. Um, it was sort of, um, uh, sort of, acknowledging the past um you know being reusing them rather than just leaving their, them there as rubbish is, is a nice thing to do um so it's not quite as bad as it seems but as a consequence when uh the egyptologists started working here we got to see a lot of the original Amon Hotel the third blocks which was rather useful now, this is the plan of the temple, um, and it is it is the same, you know, the first pylon there, first courtyard, second pylon, second courtyard, hyperstyle hall, sanctuaries, and the storage areas, magazines around here. Temple palace there, sacred lake there, but it's a lot smaller. So if you haven't got a lot of time, you have to make it a lot smaller. Now today it looks like this. Now that might look a little disappointing, but it's actually not because the Swiss who did the reconstruction here did it rather cleverly and, and what they've done is in the floor they've put paving stones to show you where the columns were, where the walls were, everything like that. So if you've been to the other temples and seen them up, then you go to this one, it's not too tricky to imagine what it must have looked like. Um, this is what it must have looked like. Um, this is um, from a university website and it's got all the temples on it and uh, it, it's uh, really handy to show you. So, first pylon, first courtyard, second pylon, second courtyard, hyperstyle, sanctuaries, sacred lake, and storage magazines and the temple palace would have been off here it's not sure well it might be that bit there actually it's a bit difficult to see on this slide um <clears throat> so uh quite close to the cultivation um with a mud brick enclosure wall going all the way around now the swiss have also done this rather clever thing um they've got only a few bits of block so rather than um, reconstruct a load and make it look terribly artificial, what they do is they put it on a plinth, um, sometimes at the approximate heights or in the approximate relationships, and then they put these steel plates up, showing you what the whole scene looked like and highlighting the bit of stone that we've got on top of the plinth. So you get a picture of the whole thing, but they haven't um, sort of, you know, reconstructed an entire temple. So it's quite a clever way of doing it. I, I quite liked it. Um, now here you've got uh, the um, uh, colonnade, the first courtyard, the uh, Israeli stele over there. And then you've got a piece of original block there on its plinth showing you that that was in fact a lintel there um, and it would have been probably about this height going along up there so um, 
like I say, quite clever way of doing the reconstruction. Here's the Israeli stele. It's not the original one. The original one is in the Cairo Museum because it's a terribly important um, piece. On one side, it has an inscription by Amenhotep III, and that's the back as we see it here. And on this side, it has an inscription by Meren Ptah. And it mentions what we think are the Israelis saying, you know, I mean, it's one of these boastful inscriptions, you know, I conquered everywhere and I'm terrific. Um, and it's, he says, and Israel was laid low. So it's quite a, a significant sort of meshing the Bible and ancient Egyptology together. Um, like I say, the original's in the Cairo Museum, but it's a very good reconstruction. Um, this is the sacred lake. Um, it's not actually got water in it, but it is moist. And as a consequence, you've got these really pretty flowers growing in there, which I quite like. Um, and it's to the side of the temple, as is the the Ramseum, the Seti Wan, uh, um, and sorry, when I said Ramseum, as we suspect the Ramseum must be, because they're using this same layout all the place. They haven't actually found the sacred lake at the Ramseum yet. Um, they're still looking, but they're looking in this location because of this consistency of layout. Now, um, if you remember when we were in Medne Habu, we had a sun court, and this is the remnants of the sun court. So this is showing you where the walls would have been, but it would have been open to the sun, and this is the altar here, and they would have laid offerings on it so that when the sun rose, um, then it would get the benefits of the offerings. And in this sun court is the only representation left of Meren Ptah in this temple. But it is quite a nice one. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, to speak the name of the dead is to make them live again. So I think we should uh, definitely make a point of mentioning Meren Ptah and looking at his um, picture while we're going round the temple. But the big thing is the Amenhotep the third stuff. Now, what they have is, because these are, are very, very colourful and, and really well scrummy, um, they're in underground storage rooms and you have to get the Guardian to go along and get the key and unlock them. And sometimes this takes a little bit of time. And So be patient. Um, I, I tell a little joke about uh, a Mexican who was asking his Egyptian friend if there was an Arabic word that means manana, and the Egyptian thought for a bit and said, no, there was nothing that had that degree of urgency. So it's a good idea when you're doing your sightseeing in um, Egypt to remember that little joke. I make you a hell of a sight more relaxed and, and you'll just take things as they come. Now, uh, we've got the king um, looking very virile and young there in front of a very damaged god. King, very damaged god. So this is more of our Amarna damage where they've hacked away at him and then it has been recarved. This is actually Armin Min. You can see he's got his arm up and his penis out. Um, you can always tell when it's on and then. Um, here, you've got the king wearing the Nemi's headcloth. Um, and uh, we've got Armin next to him. Um, again, you can see how they damaged it out, but they've started to recarve it. But isn't the carving of Amon Hotep III really really scrummy now the apart from the storage rooms there is also um, a little museum which is lovely um, site museums are, are actually quite unusual in Egypt um, and this is small but um, uh, very very nice and it has these jackal-headed sphinxes in it now 
if you remember when we started at Karnak, I said that the Avenue of Sphinxes was ram-headed because a ram was a symbol of Armon and it was Armon's um, temple. We have got now more and more, because they're actually discovering some round by the Ramesseum, jackal-headed sphinxes on the West Bank. And uh, it, w there's no um, actual publication about this yet discussing it, but one does wonder if jackal-headed sphinxes were the, the thing to have on the West Bank because of the associations with mummification and the dead and so forth. And that on the East Bank, you would have the ram's headed because of Armen. Anyway, they're really, really, really cute. Um, they have Pharaoh in between the paws, um, protecting them. And you can just see the head of one there. And that's the figure being protected there. There's some other sphinxes in here, big paws, and then they've got this um, uh, way of putting up the pieces on the wall. Now, th they've actually got stuff, it goes around chronologically, right from Hatshepsut um, to Mer Merinpetar on this site that they found. <coughs> So here you can see one of these little sort of jigsaw puzzly things, um, lots and lots of colour, um, really, 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 really pretty. Um, I, I think it must have looked absolutely gorgeous when it was all up. Um, I mean, look at that little flower there. It's really sweet, isn't it? Now. Marin Patar is very small, so um, you know that is it. Uh, but it is a temple worth visiting. But I think it's worth visiting in conjunction with the Ramesseum and with Seti One, because then you can see the sort of grandfather, father, son aspect of it, and you get more of a, a picture of the continuity and how it works. So see you in the next module where we see his dad.